But our point from these short uh, classes is not only to learn necessarily the beauty and uh, the story of the parasha, rather to see how it's applying to my life and how I can put it into action because every week has a certain energy that if I'm able to tap into this energy, I'm able to refine one part of my Avodat Hashem, my service of God. So, <clears throat> this parasha is called Kitisa. And <clears throat> in this parasha, we experience one of the worst sins in history. The sin of the golden calf. That up until today we're suffering, up until today we're praying for it. And really, this is one of the worst sins that our nation had in our history. And we all have in me the concept of the golden calf. That I go away. And there's a big question. Why, why did Hashem made it happen? I mean, I understand here a problem, here something small, but how, how can you explain that such a big thing that changed the history of our nation to a point that up until today we're praying for it, so to say. Why would Hashem do that? Why? And this question comes up a lot when something bad happens in my life. And I ask, why? Why did it have to happen? Now more than that, I usually ask this question the most when I fail in something. I try to do something good, and then it fails. And then I ask, why? Why? Why did I have to fail? I put all my effort in it. I put all my love. I put all my attention. Why did I have to fail? So, there's a story of a, uh, an individual that after 20 years of his life, got fired. One day he comes to the job and the boss fires him. Needless to say, it was a shock. But he was like, okay, nothing happened. Must be a good reason. He takes all the money that he saved and he's like, okay, I'm going to open a business. And he comes up with an idea and he starts developing and looking for a space. And after a couple of months, with the money that he saved, he opens his store. Finally comes the day of opening the store. And he's all excited, coming in the morning to the store, all happy. He comes home and his face is like, his wife tells him, well, how was your uh, first day? He says, terrible. I didn't even, even sell one thing. She says, okay. First day, don't you need to get excited, you know? Don't worry. Just, uh, you know, it's fine. He goes the next day, opens the store. Renewed energy, he's all happy. And he comes home. This time he comes home with a smile. So his wife is like, no, what happened? He's like... Listen, it wasn't that great, but I saw one thing today. So she's like, see, you know, with the right attitude, you, you, you'll make it. The third day he goes again. This time he comes home. <coughs> completely his face is... His wife is like, what happened today? She says, don't ask. Today was worse than the first two. She was like, what, you didn't sell anything? He told her, worse. The guy who bought something yesterday came to return it. So, <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes we, we do a lot of effort. After we got the first slap to the face, like the person who got fired, we get a slap to our face and we somehow get our act together and we, we, we get up and we, not, we come with the right spirit and I'll make it, I'll do it. And then we get another slap to the face, and another slap to the face, and then comes the last one, is even worse. And we come to a question and say, why? why? Hashem, why? I need to know why. Now, first of all, you know, when things go good, when I have success in something, we don't ask why. We just dance. We're like happy that, that there was a success. So today we're not going to talk about success. Today we're going to talk about the failures. And we happen to have a lot of failures. When we have a failure, that's when I ask why. Now, I first of all, when I have a failure, I want to, I want to know what do I need to learn from the failure? 
I need to know. I'm a smart person. My head is screwed very well into my body. I'm a, a God-fearing person. I know that there's a cause, there's a reason, there's everything. I want to know right now why, not why I failed. Why, what the Kadosh Baruch is trying to tell me? What's the cause of the fail? What do I need to learn out of that? More than that, I want to know what Hashem wants for me. Does Hashem wants me to try more? Does Hashem want, want me to go to a completely different place? What does Hashem want for me? So there's a few questions that's coming up when there's a failure. First of all, wh why the failure? What do I need to take out of this failure? More than that, what does Hashem wants for me? Not only that, what do I need to learn out of the failure? Now, in this parasha, it kind of explains it. Because we were facing with really the, one of the worst sins in history, the sin of the golden calf. Now, you can easily ask, what did Hashem want from the Jews? But more than that, you have to ask even a bigger question. Why a, go why a calf? Why not a man? I mean, uh, now I want to understand one thing. The Torah is presenting to me a severe sin. A severe sin that changed the face of our, so to say, religion, our nation. It's completely affected by this, by this sin. Then up until today, really, we have to fix the sin of the golden calf. And, and, and needless to say what the suffering that we went through. So, but the Torah comes to tell me something. It's not coming to tell me an historical event, because there are many historical events that the Torah did not mention. The Torah comes from the word in Hebrew, Hora'ah, to teach me. So the Torah comes to teach me something. I want to know right now, what is the sin of the golden calf coming to teach me? What's the failure here? Now, when I'm looking into it, then I can ask a bunch of questions. First of all, why a calf? Why not a man? First of all, why an animal? If they went to worship, they now, basically the sin in the golden calf, just so we know a little bit of the history, Moshe Rabbeinu comes, takes the Jews out of Mitzrayim, takes them through the desert, they cross the sea, they come to Har Sinai, they get the Torah, they see godly revelations. Then they start traveling in the, in the desert, and we see unbelievable things happening. And then the whole thing happens. Now how does it really happen? Matan Torah happened on Shabbat. Matan Torah was the wedding between Hashem and the Jews. Now, when you go to a wedding, it has to be a ktubah, has to be a, a, a certificate, a marriage certificate. And also has to be a ring, has to be some type of uh, something that has value to it. So Moshe Rabbeinu had to go and get the ktubah. He has to go up on the mountain. More than that, he says to everybody, listen, we just heard the Ten Commandments. Did, did you understand anything? No. Okay, so let me go get the Torah. Let me get the interpretation so we can understand what we need to do. So Moshe Rabbeinu tells them, listen, I'm going up to the mountain. I'm going for 40 days. He tells them when he's coming down. He tells them, please be patient. I'm coming down with the Ketubah. And then he disappears. 40 days pass, nobody comes down. Moshe is not coming down. Right away they start worrying, wait a minute. He's 40 days on the mountain. He's not, he didn't take food with him. How is he going to eat? How is he going to drink? Meaning, if he didn't drink and didn't eat for 40 days, he must be dead. More than that, the Satan comes and shows them a, a, a scene of Moshe Rabbeinu lying on his bed and the angels are coming around him and, and so to say his death. And the Satan, the devil shows this, and Moshe Rabbeinu, he could make it. Now, at the time, the concept of near-death experience was not so popular like today. <laughs> now it's very popular. You go on YouTube and you do near-death experience, you'll see a bunch of people that come back from the dead. But 3,300 years ago, it wasn't so common. So they, they did not think that Moshe Rabbeinu can have a near-death experience and come back. So like, okay, he's dead. He died. So they decide to say, okay, we don't have a leader right now. 
we don't have a connection to our master, let's, uh, let's make a, a, a god to worship. Now, who do they go to? They go to Aaron. And believe it or not, Aaron agrees. And he says, okay, let me help you. Now, Aaron had a plan. He's like, listen, I cannot stop them. If I'm going to come and try to stop them, they're not going to listen to me. So he says, let me play the game. I will play like as if I'm participating. I'll stall. And in the meantime, Moshe Rabbeinu will come down. So he tells them, okay, let's make it out of gold. Why gold? Because he says, who has the gold? The women. <coughs> I mean, the men bring the presents, the jewelry, to the women. Which is the women has gold. You think the women are going to give the gold? They're not going to give the gold. You know that actually the women didn't even participate in the gold, golden calf. That's why the women got to the holiday. The day of Rosh Chodesh is a celebration, is a festival for women. Because the women did not want to participate in the golden calf. So Aaron was smart. He was like, let's make it out of gold. So the men go to the women. The women shoo them off. No, nope, we're not giving you our gold. So the men also had a little bit of gold. So they took the gold of their own. Later on, that's why the women, I have a lecture online, if you want to see, it's a very interesting lecture about the connection between women, Rosh Chodesh, and, and reading of Tehilim and David HaMelech. It's a very interesting class where I kind of connect everything together. And I explain there why the women got the festival of Rosh Chodesh and the, how they didn't accept to be part participating in the golden calf and so forth. So, Aaron was trying to stall. But then his plan didn't work out. They just took the gold, threw it in the fire, and whoop, comes out a golden calf. So first of all comes a big question, why a calf? From all animals. First of all, why an animal? Do it a human being? You want to worship somebody? Worship a human being. Why are you worshiping a, an animal? And not only an animal, why a, a calf? What's a calf? Why not a, I don't know, a, a lamb? And another question is, why Aaron had to participate here? I mean, later on, you know, Aaron didn't get punished at all. Not only that he didn't get punished, he was appointed to be the priest that blessed everybody. And later on, the one to slaughter the calves and the bulls in order to atone for the sins. So, really, the real question is why? Why does the Torah come and tell me about this entire scene? And why did it really do it? Why did they could not wait? They, could not, they waited 40 days. They could not wait another minute. I'm sure Aaron told him, listen, guys, Moshe Rabbeinu told us he's coming down. He's coming down? You know, Moshe came down a couple of minutes later. Why? So I want to learn something from that. And if the Torah goes in length and goes out of its way to tell me about this entire scene, then there's something for me to learn out of that. Now, usually we know that the title of a good article is what's going to draw me to come into the article. If the title of the article is not good, I'm not going to read the article. I don't read newspapers, and I don't go on websites, and I don't waste my time on that. There's one website that I go on because it's not really a news website. All the news websites like CNN and Fox and ABC, it's all lies. There's, there's nothing there. And there's a few websites that are really telling you the truth and then they get shut, shut down somehow. But there's one website that I go where I get my, a little bit of information about what's going on in the world and that's it. And I only read the titles. I don't read the actual article. It doesn't, I don't care about the article. I care about the title and you know there's a subtitle that has a few more sentences. That's it. So a good reporter will give you a really good title. And if the title is real good, then you'll go and read the article. We use the same methods when we post a video online. If you notice, all my videos online have a very good title. And now I'm revealing my, my secrets. But when we analyze my followers, then we have the die-hard followers that will be the first one. The video just goes on YouTube and they right away go and see it. And then there's the followers that come a couple of days later because they have uh, a few other places where they like to learn. 
and I'm sharing my strategies right now. And then there's the followers that don't know come so often, and then the new ones, I mean, we have kind of an idea what's going on. So, and of course, we're in the outreach business, so the videos are not only to entertain the ones who already know me, it's to get constantly new viewers, new followers. So the titles have to be very catchy. And if you follow me, then you'll see online that also the thumbnails are very catchy. They're not just a bistama thumbnail of a picture. They usually are very interesting because we're using all sorts of uh, methods of, uh, of marketing. Why? To get attention. And you know what? It works. So the same idea here is Hashem is a very, very good reporter. So he titled the parashot with a very catchy title. To us, it seems like one or two words that it's hard for us to remember. If you ask now almost any religious person to tell you all the parashot in order, they're not going to know how to say that. It's unfortunate. Very few people, that's why they teach the kids the, the name of the parashot with a song. Why? Come now to an average religious man or woman, tell them, can you tell me now all the parashot in order? They're not going to be able to name them in order, which one might think you're, you're a religious Jew. The minimum you should know is the names of the parashot. But, the Kadosh Baruch is a very a good marketer, so in the name has the, the catch of the entire parasha. So this name is called Kitisa. And what does it say? Kitisa et Rosh Bnei Israel. This is to elevate. Which means that the, the, the body of the parasha, the content, is a terrible sin. But the title is not, no, I'm not talking about a sin here. I'm talking about because I'm going to elevate you all. So here already there's a, a hint of what's going on here. If the Torah goes in length to tell me about a terrible sin, but it titles it in the complete opposite, in, in the motion of an elevation, that in itself needs to find my attention to go and read into the parasha. Now, we understand that from the content of the parasha was a terrible, terrible sin. And one can come with many different questions. Why and how and why did they do that? Why did they do such a thing? Forty days before that, they saw the Kadosh Baruch If I would see the Kadosh Baruch I would not think for one second to go and worship a, 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 a calf. So it's a little bit mind-boggling. It has to be something very, 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 very deep in here. So there's a question, there's a story that there was one person who was going through a very hard time. Everything that he did did not work well. He tried this business, was a failure. He tried this marriage, failure. All, everything that he tried was a failure. <coughs> and he was really getting upset. And at some point, he's, he's like, I have to figure out what's going on. So they told him, you know, there's a guru somewhere in the mountains. Go to him. He has all the answers. Okay. The guy goes, packs a bag, starts climbing on the mountain. And finally he gets to this guru that he's like secluded from the world. He's sitting in a yoga position, long beard, he's not connected to the world. And he tells him, listen, I'm a failure and I want you to tell me, how can I deal with all my failures? So the guru tells him, you see that pot on the fire over there? Why don't you put in this pot of fire a piece of carrot and, a bo and a, an egg and a little bit of coffee beans and wait. Okay, he says, I came all this way for to be a cook, start cooking some carrots for him. And, okay, well, I'm already here, I'll do that. So he takes a pot, he puts some carrots in the pot, starts boiling them, takes another pot, puts some eggs in it, starts boiling the eggs. Takes another pot, puts some coffee beans in it, and starts boiling the coffee beans. He's waiting and waiting. After a while, he tells the guru, uh, besides dinner, are you going to teach me something? So he tells him, now go to the pots. And what do you see there? So he says, I see dinner. <laughs> what you told me to make. He's like, what do you really see? You put all three in the exact same place, in the boiling hot water of a pot. But the reaction, the result, is completely different from each and every one of them. The carrots became soft. The egg became hard. 
and the coffee, the coffee beans kind of melted and it gives this unbelievable aroma. Now you have this beautiful tasting coffee. So he says, this is basically what happens in our life. We are placed in many different situations, but all the situations are the same. But every person, the result is completely different. One person goes through a certain failure and he's going to be like the carrot. He becomes soft, meaning he becomes desperate or he falls into despair, falls into sadness, falls into depression, can't handle the, 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 the failure and it makes him soft in the level that he's completely falling apart. Another person has the exact same situation, the same test. Instead of becoming soft, he becomes like the egg, he becomes hard. But this hardness will come out as anger. And he's going to start screaming in the Kadosh Baruch I hate you. I don't want to serve you anymore. I don't want to do your Torah and mitzvahs anymore. I, I, and he goes against. And he's upset at the Kadosh Baruch And he says, and the third type of person is like the coffee. He'll go through the same exact situation. But you know what's going to come out of it? Beautiful smell. And a good cup of coffee. And it's not going to take him to the negative place, not to the positive, not, not negative in, in, in both ways, rather to a very positive place. They all were placed in the same situation. So, when I'm looking at this terrible sin, then there's many ways of dissecting it. But I want to start taking it into my life. And in my life, I have failures, constantly. Constantly I have failures, and I can either fall into the category of the carrot, that I fall into despair, into sadness, into being depressed, or I can fall into a different category, or that it's hardening me, and now I'm going against the Kadosh Baruch and I don't like it, and I'm, I don't like Hashem right now, and I get upset, so I don't want to do your mitzvot, and your Torah is worthless, and I go totally against the Kadosh Baruch Or, which is pretty rare, but I can also find myself that the problem can actually get the best out of me and refine me. It all depends what I choose. Now, it says, when it's talking about the golden calf, it's talking about it in the Talmud, in the tractate of Masichet Shabbat, that it's saying, when it's talking about the golden calf, it says, Amar Ula, Ula is a Tana, is a sage, Aluva kala mezana betocha chupa. The bride that is, so to say, cheating on her husband in her chupa is aluva. Aluva is like real, real. I don't even know how to translate aluva. Demoralized. Like, excuse me? It's demoralized. Demoralized? Demoralized. Takes away the moral. The so thing. aluva comes from the word aluv, like real, real <coughs> disgusting. Low. low and disgusting. So, and he says that the bride, that in the chupa, with her husband, already cheats on her husband, then she be goes, becomes the worst, and the worst, and the worst. Now, I told you, Matan Torah was on Shabbat. And Shabbat was the wedding. Later on, I told you, Moshe Rabbeinu went up on the mountain. And when he was failing, or being late to come down, the son of Miriam, his name was Chur, he went and fought and he went against them and he's like, no, why are you doing that? If Moshe Rabbeinu told you, he took us out of Mitzrayim, he went up on the mountain to get to the, the, ten, the ten Commandments, we, well, you don't have a little bit of trust in him? He said he's coming, coming, coming down. He told us he's taking us out of Egypt, he took us out of Egypt. He took us, told us he's going to take us to Har Sinai, he took us to Har Sinai. You can't believe him one more time. So they killed him. Aaron Akoen said no. I'm, I'm not going to go against them. You know, they say in, in America, if you can win them, join them. So who could not win them, they killed him. He died on Kiddush Hashem. But Aaron says, listen, I'm not going to die on Kiddush Hashem. Why? Because I'm going to make them do what I want them to do. I'm going to manipulate so to say the situation. 
And how did he do that? He was able to manipulate the situation. And, and it's, 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 there's a joke that kind of kind of explains this, that there was once a, a, a teacher who was a big atheist. And all his agenda was to teach the children that there's no Kadosh Baruch There's no God, there's no Torah, there's no nothing. So he says, you see, he took like, like, uh, you know, a book. He says, you see this book? See that the book exists. And he took a chair, he says, you see this chair? This chair exists. And he gave more examples. And then he says, do you see God anywhere? No, because he doesn't exist. So one smart student stood up and says, you know what? I like your example. So now I'm looking, he told all the kids, you see the teacher? Yes. Do you see his brain? No. Must be that he doesn't have, that his brain does not exist. So, so, so Aaron Akoen was trying to, to, to manipulate the situation. Who came and says, listen, you have to believe. They said, listen, we don't see Moshe, we don't believe. We don't see Hashem, we don't believe. We want to see something. That's what we want. That's why they took a, a, a calf, because they wanted to see something. They didn't say we don't believe in God. We just said we don't see Him. So we need a mediate, a mediator to see. Moshe Rabbeinu we were able to see, so now we don't see Him. So we need something to see. So Aaron was trying to manipulate, he wasn't like who, he was trying to manipulate the situation by saying, listen, I can't fight them, let me join them. That's why he was trying to stall and telling them, give me the gold, give me this, do that. He was trying to, to, to stall the situation. Now, the, see, that's the golden calf, don't worry. So, Aaron Akoen did not want to fight them because he knew he won't be able to, 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 to win them. They wanted to see something. They did not want to, to believe in something that doesn't exist. And they said, we will do uh, what's called like a vessel, a tzino, something that will connect us to the Kadosh Baruch They called it a small God. God we can't see. And we don't have a mediator to connect us to God, so we're going to make like a small God, and that's going to connect us to Hashem. And therefore, we're going to make this golden calf. Now, the question it comes, why a uh, calf? Why uh, 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 a calf and not an, any other animal? A human being they did not want to do, because Aaron Akoin told, told him, don't do a human being. Now, in, a, in regards to the animal, why an animal? Because when they were standing on the, beneath the mountain of Har Sinai, they saw a godly revelation. If you read the Haftarah of the parasha of Matan Torah, of Yitro, it's talking about the revelation that the prophet Yechezkel had. And this is called Maasemer Kava, the chariot, the heavenly chariot. And they saw it. It says that at the time it was such a high godly revelation that what they saw there, the great prophets didn't see. And what did they see in the, this Merkava, in this chariot? They saw four corners, that each corner was a face. And this face was holding the chair of the Kadosh Baruch This is in the prophecy of Yechezkel. So they saw in one corner a face of a lion, which is the king of the animals. Another corner, a face of an ox, which is the king of the cattle, of the, the, the kosher animals. Another corner, a face of an eagle, who is the king of the birds. And another corner, the face of a human being. So they said, oh, that's where they got the idea of the calf. And they're like, okay, we're going to make a calf. Really, why did they make a, the, the calf? Because what was the idol of the Egyptians? was a lamb, a tele. They saw in their level that what's the month of uh, 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 the month that before they went out of Mitzrayim, well, they, they, they saw the sign was tele. What was the month that comes after that, after the redemption? 
the sign was an ox. So they were like, okay, if we do an ox, then we're going to overpower, so to say, the god of the Egyptians. So that's where they came with the, the, the analogy, the conclusion to do a calf. Now, Aaron Cohen says, listen, he knew exactly what's going on and he knew that Moshe Rabbeinu was going to come. But he didn't want, he didn't want them to do a big sin. So he made a quick calculation and he says, I'd rather them do a small sin than to do a big sin. What was the small sin? To create an idol. What's the big sin? To bow to the idol. So Aaron said, okay, listen, I'd rather not die like Chor on Kiddush Hashem. I'd rather participate and help them do a small sin. But at least I will prevent them from doing a very big sin. Doesn't matter, he didn't care about himself right now. He just cared that they're not going to do a big sin. Because to, to create a small idol, we're not allowed to. But it's not considered as bad as bowing to the idol. I mean, I'm not allowed to make any type of idol. I'm not allowed even to draw a, a, a shape. I'm not allowed to draw a shape of a sun. That's like drawing myself an idol. But it's not considered a severe sin. The severe sin is to bow to the idol. So Aaron says, you know what, let me just stop them, at least save them from a serious battle, let them be busy with building the idol, then Moshe Rabbeinu is going to come and destroy the idol. Because they're not going to bow to it. Then they're going to really fall into idol worship, and then it's going to be almost re irreversible to change. So Aaron said, okay, let me help them. Now, from this we learn a very, very important thing because we face this exact same reality constantly. Are we allowed to do a very small sin in order to save somebody from doing a big sin? It's a big question that we run into many different times. If I have the opportunity now to save a person from doing a small sin and I'm participating and I'm taking on myself a sin, but I'm going to prevent that person from doing a very big sin. Am I allowed to do that? It's a very big question because there, I'll give you a few scenarios and you'll see how so, so many times we're presented with this scenario. Now imagine now I have a friend who doesn't keep Shabbat. And I know he doesn't keep Shabbat. And he calls me on Shabbat. I see the phone ring. And I'm looking at the call ID. I know it's him. I know he's desecrating Shabbat now. Now I know that this friend is OCD. And he's going to continue calling till I answer. So I know he's about to call now 25 times. He's not going to finish calling till I answer. So am I allowed to answer the phone to tell him stop calling? Because I know I'm going to answer one time the phone. But I'm going to prevent him from 25 times calling. Right? I'm doing one small sin versus many big sins. So this is one scenario. You can give me the answer in a second. You, you think I'll give you a few scenarios. Now I'll give you a different scenario. A woman is pregnant. And she feels contractions. Pikuach <gasps> nefesh, right? You can take her to the hospital. The husband picks up the phone, calls the ambulance. She tells him, I'm delivering. I feel pain. He calls the ambulance. The ambulance comes. He put the phone down. Five minutes later, she tells him, you know what? I'm so sorry. I just have some pain. I don't, I'm, it's not labor. I'm not going into contractions. I just had a little bit of pain. Now, should he call now the ambulance to stop them from coming? There's no pikuach nefesh anymore. But there are three guys running in an ambulance. And they're Jews. And there's no pikuach nefesh right now. So should he call them and sin? Now it's not, now he, before, that's not Chilul Shabbat. Now it's Chilul Shabbat because he's picking up the phone. There's no pikuach nefesh. Should he call them and tell them, listen, stop. Because if I don't tell them to stop, three of them are going to lecharik secret Shabbat. And giving back the ambulance, putting the ambulance, driving, and ooh, and then. So is he allowed to call them and tell them to stop? So there's a many, many questions. I'll give you one more scenario. You see many times a person goes to the middle of nowhere, you see these Chabad emissaries that they go to the like, Kimbaktu or whatever. And not only Chabad emissaries, now it's popular, you see many people, they go to the middle of nowhere. I, I just went now to Phoenix, 
to a, a, a congregation and the, the, the rabbi who went out there is a Sephardi Bukharian rabbi he's not officiated or associated with Chabad he went there to the middle of nowhere and he created a, a community but you see now that it's very very popular but you see that an individual will go to the middle of nowhere where he cannot pray in a minyan he cannot on Shabbat listen to a Sefer Torah he cannot do many things but on the other hand he's going to affect many 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 people so is he allowed to do that? So, so to say, he's not really doing a sin, but he's missing out on a lot of things that he's supposed to do. <coughs> he's supposed to daven, to pray in a minyan. He's supposed to listen to the Torah on Shabbat. He's supposed to do many things that he's now going to be missing to do. But on the other hand, he's going to save and help a lot of people. So you have three different scenarios that I'm uh, uh, questioned. Am I allowed to do a small sin in order to prevent somebody from doing a big sin? And... In some cases, I'm allowed. <coughs> now, the rule is like this. First of all, I'm allowed to stop a person from doing a big sin in one of these situations that I told you, if it's before he started the sin, not while he's already doing the sin. So for the first scenario with the friend that calls, he already started the sin. So I can't pick up the phone and tell him, stop calling. Because some people might say, I'd rather do a small sin, but I will make him stop doing so many times the calls. So here I'm not allowed to because he already started. The rule is that I, can, I am allowed to stop somebody from doing a sin, but before he started already. In the scenario, for example, with the ambulance, I'm not allowed to pick up the phone and tell them not to come. Because I'm just, the, 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 I'm not allowed to do that. Because once they left the entire crew for the cause of Pikuach Nefesh, Till they return back and they stop, there is one big thing. They, they don't need to stop. They were called out on Pikuach Nefesh, they're allowed to desecrate Shabbat. Even though it's a false alarm, they're they allowed to, to, to finish it. I mean, I've seen in many situations that you see the ambulance, he comes on Shabbat. Two stay behind and the driver returns the ambulance. He can return the ambulance back because it's one long thing. And in regards to the rabbi that goes out in the middle of nowhere, he's allowed to go from what's called milchatchila, because he didn't even start the sin. He didn't even start anything. But the, when you, the second rule is that if you're going to save a lot of people, you're allowed to do the sin. That's the rule. So you have two rules here. A is that the person cannot start the sin. B is if you save a lot of people. So if I'm saving a lot of people, I'm allowed to do a small sin in order to say, knowing that it will save a lot, lot of people. And that's what Aaron Akohen did. He says, I will do a small sin, but in essence, I'm not going to save a lot of people. I'm going to save all the people, the entire nation I'm going to save. That's why Aaron Akohen participated. That's why he didn't get punished. Because he didn't say, he said face to face, I can't win them. They're going to kill me. I'm not going to get anything. They're going to do the, 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 hard, the worst sin. Let me get them to do and to be busy with a small sin. At least they're not going to bow to the idol. At least they're not going to fail in a big, big sin. So, <clears throat> Can I ask a question? I'm going to finish in a few minutes, then we'll do the questions. Now, I heard a very interesting, we're done really in a few minutes. I heard a very interesting story, and this will kind of sum up the whole topic. I heard from a, 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 a friend of mine who's a Chabad rabbi in Belgium, a very interesting story. If you know, in Belgium, it's one of the biggest capitals of diamonds in the world, at least in Europe. Everybody goes there to deal with the diamonds. They have a very big market and, and, uh, and a lot, a lot of Jews go there, especially for whatever reason, from the, the, the Bukharians, they do a lot of business there. Uh, the uh, p people from uh, Georgia do a lot of business there. There's a lot, a lot of Jews going on there. A lot of Jews get there. So the story goes that there was one individual, he's from a uh, Bukharian descent, that came to the rabbi and told him, listen, I need a very big tikkun. I need to fix something. I need a very big, big boo-boo. Uh, Let's put it this way. What's the problem? Half a year ago, 
my wife and me took on ourselves to keep Shabbat. And for half a year we were going very, very well. You know the story? That's why you're laughing? Oh. So, it's a true, true story. Everything here is true. No jokes. So, and he tells him, okay, what's the problem? He, says, he tells him, listen, you know we're all in the jewelry business. And this year, the New Year's, the, the, the non-Jewish New Year's, fell exactly on the weekend. And this is the time when we really do, when we take it to the bank. Why? Because it's the New Year's after their, their holiday and it's on the weekend. That's where they all spend their money. This is when we really do our biggest, biggest uh, uh, time of, uh, in business. And everybody makes huge amounts of money. And he says, I had this huge Nisayon. I mean, I, I took on myself not to keep Shabbat. I mean, I took on myself, sorry, to keep Shabbat. And here I'm placed with this Nisayon. This is my business. This is the day of the year where I can make 10 times more than I make the entire year. On this day. And he tells me, tells the rabbi, you know what? Saturday morning comes. I, I could not control my legs. I could not control my legs and my legs went into the market. I just could not control my legs. And I went there. And I opened the... The, the basta, how do you know, how do you call it, the, the, the stand. And at some point I caught myself, it was 10 o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, what am I doing here? And I left, and I went straight home. And I come home, my wife had a beautiful table ready, a kiddush cup on the table, and she thinks I came home from shul. And I came home from the market. And he's like, I was so disappointed. I, I, I filled this cup instead of with wine, with vodka. And I said, Shehakol, and say, Bore Priagafen. And I did Kiddush on the entire cup. It knocked me out. And I slept till 3 a.m. I just couldn't handle, I could not handle what I did. I could not handle the fact that I could not control myself and I had to go to the market. So the rabbi told him, listen, I'm religious from the day I was born and I never had the merit to have such a Shabbat like what you had. I never had to give anything up to the Kadosh Boho like you just gave, gave it up. And he totally changed the reality. He came to him to give him some type of a tikkun, something to fix what he act. The rabbi told him, wow, I never had such a Shabbat, that you were in such a place that you had to give up such, he didn't sell anything, he went to the market and made a U-turn. He said, you had to give up such a, a huge thing for a Shabbat? And he's like, I never and will never have such a, a merit to get to such a place. So, why did I tell you all this? Sometimes, and I know a lot of people don't like hearing it, but there is a source for that. And, and as this is not, not a source from Kabbalah, not a source from Hasidut, not a source from the mysticism. This is a source from the Talmud, because a lot of people come and say, Oh, all of you coming from Kabbalah, you're twisting everything. This is a source coming from the Talmud that sometimes the Kadosh Baruch Hu, and I say it so many times, and I get, I, I get opposition for that. Sometimes the Kadosh Baruch Hu turns around the situation and forces me to fail. Kadosh Baruch Hu orchestras the failure. And the failure in a sin, in a severe sin. Kadosh Baruch Hu dishes it out. And we see the first time that it happened is when the sin of David Amelech and Bathsheba, the Kadosh Baruch Hu twisted it so there'll be a sin, and a severe sin. With David and Bathsheba was a very severe sin. Two. So we see that sometimes the Kadosh Baruch Hu, so to say, manipulates and orchestras the sin. That I will fail in a severe, severe sin. So it's nothing to do with me. And I find myself in this unbelievable fail, believable failure. But why? And I ask myself, why? Why? That's what I want. 
I, 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 I want to be pure. I want to be holy. I don't want to be... Why? I did not ask this for myself. Why did I have to fall into this place? And what will happen? I will either fall into the carrot that I completely fall into despair, completely fall into to, to, to sadness, and I give up, or I will fall into the egg that I completely lose my, 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 my calmness, and I go totally against the Kadosh Baruch and I get upset at the Torah, and I get upset at the Kadosh Baruch But the Kadosh Baruch doesn't want me to fall into one of these. Kadosh Baruch wants me, he does that because he wants me to take something so low and to transform it into something good. He wants me to take the worst of the worst when I'm in the bottom of the bottom and to totally transform it and make something great out of it. Like this guy that went into the market, he could not control himself. Why do you think he could not control himself? Kadosh Baruch manipulated the situation. When the Kadosh Baruch sends the Yetzer Ha, the Yetzer is going to come with 500 horsepower. He's going to crush you without you even saying one word. The Yetzer will ram you over if he really wants to. Kadosh Baruch puts full power. No one, no one is able to stand in front of the Yetzer Ha. But the Kadosh Baruch does that because he wants the person to make the U-turn in that place. He says, no. Like this guy, I'm going to go home and do Kiddush. Yeah, I might get drunk, I might feel so horrible that I need to knock myself down, but I'm going to go back, I'm not going to sell anything. The Kadosh Baruch is turning around situations in our life all the time that I will fail. I'm not talking right now that my business didn't work out. I'm not talking about right now and basic things. I'm talking about that I run into failures in my life. I want to be holy and the Kadosh Baruch is going to push me to the ground and I'd be like, why? I don't want to do this sin right now. I work so hard on my tshuva. Why? Why do I have to fail right now? And again, I'm not talking about failing in my business. That's a total different why right now. I'm, I care about just being connected to the Kadosh Baruch Why do I have to now fail in this Lashon Or Oh, Chas B'Shalom is something even worse. Or lying or cheating. Or... Kadosh Baruch wants me to go to the depth of the depth and transform the darkness into light. And to take this bottom and the bottom, take this evil and correct it. How can I correct something bad if I'm not there? What, from sitting out there and from far away and saying, no, Kadosh Baruch will take me to the klipa, to the worst, says now fix it. And if you can't do it the first time, then I'll give you another chance, then I'll give you another chance, but I want you to fix it. And that's why the Kadosh Baruch turns things around. And that's why Kadosh Baruch put this golden calf. He put this Yetzer Ara that they could not hold himself. They could not wait another minute. He could not wait another two, three minutes. No. Kadosh Baruch put this such a powerful desire so they will fall into one of the worst sins of idol worship. Why? So they can climb from that and refine it and to fix it and to take this evil and darkness and to completely change it. Completely, completely change it. And what I want to take from this parasha, why is this called Kitisa? Because if you, if you fall down to, this, to the depth and you refine it and you fix it, I will elevate you to a level you can't even imagine. That's why the, the, I told you the title, Kitisa. Why? I'm going to elevate you to heights that you cannot understand. But just be with me when you're down. Don't, don't lose your trust in me. Don't lose your hope in me. Don't, don't, don't give up. Because I put you there. I want you to twist the situation. And I want you to take it to a higher level. And then when, you, when you're down there, then I'll elevate you. Tisa means to elevate. And that's what I want to take from this parasha. It's one of the most important parashot in the Torah. Because I'm presented into my face a horrible situation and a sin. But who am I kidding? I sin all day long. <laughs> I'm talking about myself right now. Yeah. Not talking about you. Talking about myself, I sin all day long. We sin all day long. But the point is not to look at myself in the mirror and say, I'm a schmutz, I'm worthless. It's to say, you know what? Must be that I have to refine something here. If I fail in Lashon Aram, must mean 
that I have to refine something. If I fail in talking bad about somebody and humiliating that person and giving that person a bad name, must be that I have to go now and to create unbelievable unity between everybody in Aragon and refine it and to fix it. I have to look at the sin what I did, where Kadosh Baruch placed me, and say, okay, now what the Kadosh Baruch wants me to fix here? Kadosh Baruch wants me to fix something here, because how can I fix something if I want there to actually reach it to it and to be able to know how to fix it? That's why the power of the Baal Tshuva is such a powerful force that the, the Gemara says, Bemakom she umnim tzadikim urim enam The place where a Baal Tshuva stands, a complete tzadik cannot stand. Why? Because the Baal Tshuva is forced to go into this place. Kadosh Baruch takes me there. I told you now that now the whole story of Purim, we just finished Purim, the story of Purim is in me. We mentioned it in the Sudan, we mentioned it in the, in the previous classes. In the story of Purim, there's a king. In my life, there's a king, the king of the world. In the story of Purim, there's a tzaddik. In my life, there's a tzaddik. And if I don't have a tzaddik in my life, I have to find one. And then there's a Haman. There's a Amalek that is in me that just wants to destroy me. And then there's the queen, Esther. And there's a queen in me. I'm, I'm the queen. I'm Esther. And I'm locked in a room. And I'm locked in a palace of impurity. And now I, I'm being forced to come into the king. Every time Achashverosh wanted to see Esther, he forced her to come. She did not want to come. She was forced to come into the impurity. So I'm constantly forced to come into a place of impurity. The place of the klipa. Why? Because I need to refine it. And I need to fix it. And I too need to elevate it. That's why the, for, the power of the Baal Tshuva is, is, is so powerful that a tzaddik cannot stand there. Why? Because the Baal Tshuva went to the depth and then he made a U-turn and came back. And that's what I want to learn from this parasha. This parasha comes to teach me, don't get upset or fall into despair when I fail. You know, failure is not just me coming into the sin and chas v'shalom failing. I could not hold my yetzer ara. Yeah, there is a failure. I wanted to do a business, it didn't fail. I went on shiduch with, to, to, to go to date, that didn't work. I can, I can measure failure almost anywhere. The point is that in every failure has to come the question, why, but not why I failed. Why did the Kadosh Baruch put me here? To ask why I fell, that's not, that's not a good question. I want to ask myself the same why, but why did the Kadosh Baruch put me here? Ah, to do something. To refine the situation. Doesn't matter what it is. I had to learn something out of it. I had to bring something out of it. And when I want to apply something in my life, and when we're doing this class, not to learn about the beautiful story about the Torah, to apply something to my life, and I want to apply that I'm going to meet a failure after a failure after a failure, and the Yetzirah is the one who's going to come and tell you you are a loser, you are a nobody, Don't stop pretending you are religious, you can, you can be, cut your beard off or, or, or take your head covering off, stop pretending, that's what he's going to come and tell you all day long. But the point is, the Kadosh Baruch says, no, 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 wait, <laughs> wait, this is where the diamond is hidden, you just need to take it out and polish it. The world is full of diamonds, all these godly sparks that were scattered all over the universe. And the Shem sends me down to the world and tells me there's a diamond over there and there's a diamond over there. But the diamonds, they don't look so great because if you look how a diamond comes out of a gold, out of a diamond mine, it's a black rock. So Hashem puts me in a very bad situation and I think and I perceive that it's a bad situation but Hashem tells me, no, there's diamond in there. Just trust me, just believe in me. Just let me, I'll elevate you. Just stay strong. Don't, don't, don't let this chas v'shalom take you into chas v'shalom anger or despair. And what I want to take from this parasha is that the failure is there in order for me to refine it and to fix it. Not, not for anything else. And the more failures I run into, it means that there's nothing wrong with me. I just need to fix it. The question really right now is, is really if we can do it. And we can. This is the question. Once I've already failed, can I really get up? Can I really get up? Because that's the question that most people say. And the answer is yes, you can get up. 
You can get up from the place where you fell and says, okay, nothing happened. Let me just brush off the dirt and move on. Like we sing every Friday night, we sing Lechadudi. If you notice, look at the words. Look at the fourth paragraph. We say, Hitna'arim Get up from the dirt and brush off all the dirt. That's what it says. Referring to the person that fell, comes Shabbat and says, how can I keep Shabbat now? All week I lied and I cheated and I looked to the wrong places and I cursed and I didn't do this and I didn't do that. Now I'm going to come into this Shabbat. Shem says, yeah, brush the dirt off. Don't worry. You can take it. You can take the dirt off. And the next part of the verse says, You do that, you're going to wear the garments of the glory of my nation. So what I want to take from that is the Kadosh Baruch is going to manipulate situations that I will fail. Whether it's in my Avodat Hashem, whether I will fail in sins, whether I will fail in my, my business, or any type of thing that I want to do. But when I, the Torah comes and tells me it's a good thing to fail. This is where you come, then where you refine it. The Kadosh Baruch created it in order for you to fix it. If the world was perfect, what would I fix here? What would I do here if the world is perfect? There wouldn't be a cause for the world. Why do you think happened the sin of, of, the, of the tree of knowledge? Kadosh Baruch manipulated the situation. Shem says, what kind of a world? Who needs a perfect world? We didn't come here for a perfect world. I want you to work. I want you to refine yourself. There's a, 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 a pasuk, there's a verse that says, Ratsa Kadosh Baruch lezakot et Yisrael. The Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted to give us a lot of merits, therefore he gave us a lot of Torah and a lot of mitzvahs to do. But the Zohar says, don't say lezakot et Yisrael. It says, Ratsa Kadosh Baruch Hu lezakech et Yisrael. To refine us, to make us greater, to elevate us. To elevate us to a level that we can't even understand. So therefore Hashem gave us a lot of Torah and a lot of mitzvahs and in the mitzvahs a lot of negative mitzvahs that I can chas v'shalom fail. And a lot of situations that are not going to be so positive. Why? Because from there I can refine the situation. And that's what I want to take from this parasha and Bezrat Hashem to take from it also the power that I can, I can get up when I fall. I, I will fall a lot more. I will have a lot of times in my life that I will continue failing and falling and falling into to, to, to failures. But the point is to right away get up and to say, okay, the point is not how I fall, is how I get up. And if I get up, and if I did not get up, then the Yetzirah won. But if I was just able to get up, like this guy, he just left the market, came home and did Kiddush. Yeah, he did, he, he, he got drunk with a whole cup of, of liquor. But he just, at least he got up. And very few people are able to do it. And that's the power of the Baal Tshuva, and that's the power of what this parasha is giving me. That I have the power. If the Kadosh Baruch put me in this situation, he gives me the power. Bezad Hashem, all our failures and all our tests should be transformed into to a blessing. And the Kadosh Baruch will elevate us. We'll have the, the, the motion of Kitisa, that the Kadosh Baruch is going to elevate us to levels that we cannot even understand. And Bezad Hashem, the more we get elevated and the more we are able to overcome our obstacles, we're going to be able to be elevated to the ultimate elevation when we're going to see with our own eyes the fruits of our labor. When Mashiach is going to come very soon, we're going to see exactly what our hard labor was able to achieve. And Bezad Hashem, it's not too far. We're around the corner. We only need a few more polishes to do and we're done. Bezad Hashem, Hashem should bless us all to have a beautiful, beautiful rest of the month and a beautiful rest of the week and have an unbelievable power to be able to overcome our so to say failures, rather our successes and not the failures. So again, thank you so much, have a beautiful week.